the detective told me, you are a very lucky young lady while he's taking these photographs. He said, just last week, we found a lady cut up in a suitcase. That man had no intentions on me coming out that house. But God said otherwise. In February 8, 2021, Anthony Sal, 61, has died in Ohio State Prison Hospital. Cleveland's notorious serial killer, responsible for committing some of the most shocking crimes in the city's history. Gruesome, depraved murders have bedeviled the Mount Pleasant neighborhood for more than a decade. In the 1960s, the house at 1878 Page Avenue in East Cleveland was lime green. As well as being noteworthy, the home was the childhood home of the serial killer, Anthony Sowell. Several neighbors recall the large, two-story house in the Forest Hill Park. Anthony grew up in those walls, spending most of his childhood with his half-sister, and seven cousins. The cousins moved into the home after their mother passed away. There were many white people in the neighborhood in those days, and many working-class families lived there. It was just beginning its slow descent into poverty, and it was predominantly white. Saul never saw his father. In fact, the absence of Mr. Saul was not even mentioned. It seems that Anthony did not get along with his father for some reason. As a child, Saul did not only lack a father figure, but he also witnessed abuse. The cousins say, an adult would force them to strip butt naked, tie them up and beat them. They often whip and bind them with electrical extension cords. As a child, Anthony was shy and skinny. He was a little quiet and never led a conversation. But the cousins said he was not virgin and they used to tease him about that. Leona, his cousin says Sal took her upstairs a bedroom when they were preteens and forced her to have sex with him. She said it happened almost every day. Leona reported the rapes to authorities, but no one believed her. I don't think, the Imperial Avenue killings, would have happened, if somebody listened to her. In the late 1970s, if you were 18, and wanted out of the deteriorating East Cleveland, you could always join the Marines. And that's what Anthony Sowell did when he reported for boot camp on Jan, 1978. At Paris Island, he had at least three good reasons for getting out of town. The shy kid might have found the few, the proud slogan, a tempting one, that would have given him the boost he was looking for. But before joining, he had made a high school student pregnant. And now in the Marines, I doubt Saul learned how to subdue, and kill using his hands, and use everyday objects as improvised weapons. At the end of boot camp, Saul reported to North Carolina's camp, on April, 1978, for the then standard, 22-day introductory combat training course. The syllabus included hand-to-hand -hand combat, and close quarters combat, to develop what the Corps now calls the warrior ethos. It also had basic chokes and basic opportunity weapons. Saul spent another month at Camp Lejeune learning the basics of electrical wiring. As an electrician, he was assigned to the Marine Corps Cherry Point in North Carolina. Almost half of Seoul's seven years in the Marine Corps, were spent at Cherry Point. For at least a part of that period, he lived in a blue trailer with a white stripe, that he shared with seven other campers in a secluded area. In September 1981, five months after returning to Cherry Point, from a year-long stint in the Pacific, Sal, 22, married Kim Lawson, a fellow Marine. She passed away in 1998, when Saul was serving time in the Ohio Penitentiary. At the time, her mother told police her daughter told them, Saul was drinking excessively. 
and the reason for her marriage to him was to help him. Sao left the Marine Corps on January 1985, after a year at Camp Butler in Okinawa, Japan. He left with a footlocker filled with praise, including a Rifle Sharpshooter Award, a Good Conduct Medal, a Certificate of Commendation, and two Letters of Recommendation. He returned home to Page Avenue, and resumed a habit he had previously discarded. A habit of drinking too much alcohol. Then within a few years, he would work up a long list of arrests, that would be released to the public. A lot of arrests followed his departure from the Marines in 1985. And during the next five years, he drank, did drugs, and committed most violent crimes in East Cleveland. East Cleveland, which was a completely different place, after Sal returned to it. And so was Sal, who got himself very busy getting very drunk, and angry. There was now a 90% black population in East Cleveland. One quarter of those people lived below the poverty line. Financially, the city was in shambles. In 1985, much of Cleveland was inundated with crack, a smokable potent form of cocaine. As crime rates rose, so did the number of female addicts, who sold their bodies, to get a few rocks of crack. Into this milieu, arrived a 25-year-old man at liberty, after a seven-year military regimen. Saul was divorced after four years, from a wife worried about his drinking. He drank at least six drinks every day during this time. He acknowledged having family problems and being more aggressive when drinking, and in fact, that was the reason to serve eight days in jail for domestic violence in 1988. While his evaluation does not mention illegal drugs, his arrest record shows a 1988 charge of possessing dangerous drugs, though it doesn't say which drug. From 1986 to 1989, he was also arrested on charges of disorderly conduct, driving under the influence and public intoxication. In the meantime, terror stalked East Cleveland. Two of the women, suspected drug users, turned up dead near Soul's home after being reported missing. In May of 1988, Rosalind Garner, 36, was found dead in her home on Hayden Avenue. Rosalind had been strangled to death. On February 27, 1989, Carmen Ella Prater, 27, a resident of Page Avenue and suspected drug user, was found dead in an abandoned home, just off Hayden. One month later, on March, the body of Mary Thomas, 27, was found near an abandoned building, again on First Avenue. There was still a red ribbon around her neck to strangle Thomas. And it is not possible to solve any of the cases. The East Cleveland Police reopened both cases after Soul's arrest, in the Imperial Avenue Strangler case. No links have been set between the cases. Despite police's best efforts, Soul was linked to the attempted rape of a 21-year-old woman who was three months pregnant. In the months that followed the discovery of Thomas' body, she told her story to the authorities. On July 22, 1989, Saul met the woman in a motel. It was feared that the woman, who has a criminal record of drug use, might be arrested by police who had arrived at the motel. So Saul told her that her boyfriend was waiting for her at his house, about 500 yards away where he lived. But, when they got there, there was no sign of the boyfriend at Soul's house, but there was a bed. He threw her on it, choked, and raped her, over and over again. Then, to prevent her from leaving, Soul bound her hands with a necktie, cinched a belt around her feet, and stuffed a rag into her mouth. In the meantime, Saul, who had been drinking, Here fell asleep. To right is what appears to be a bed. Yes. And looks to be some curtains. Do you know what the curtains covered? This, the, the roof of the sausage factory. Okay. 
Did you give it to him? Yes. And what, if anything, did he do with it? He turned around, put something on it. I could hear him put something on it and light it. And I seen the smoke come up as well. All right. Did he offer you any? After he took that hit, he turned around and punched me in my face and told me to take my clothes off. He said, bitch, take your clothes off. In the July 22nd case, Sal was indicted by a grand jury. A warrant was issued for his arrest on December 8th after not showing up for his court date. Another woman, four miles away, and seven months later, also said that Sal raped her. In the early hours of June 24, 1990, the woman went to a house on East 71st Street in Cleveland. She sat on a love seat next to Saul, and started drinking. Then suddenly, he raised his hands and choked her, spitting obscenities about sex acts, how and where he would violate her, and saying that she was his bike, and she should get used to it. He dragged her upstairs by the neck, and raped her orally, vaginally, and anally, although she told him she was five months pregnant and begged him to stop. Instead, Saul forced her to say, yeah, sir, that's okay, according to police report. Again, Saul went to sleep, and she left. But she returned again with the police and he was still asleep. Charges were never filed against him after police said the woman could not be located to testify. But when Saul was in jail awaiting trial in the 1989 rape case, in 1990, Judge James sentenced him to 15 years in prison after pleading guilty to a lesser charge of attempted rape. Now 31, the shy kid from East Cleveland is a convict. During his time in prison, Saul attended meetings of at least two 12-step programs, Alcoholics Anonymous and Adult Children of Alcoholics. However, in Sowell's case, Step 5 didn't seem to follow him when he attempted to get help behind bars for his sexual obsessions. In 1993, Sal enrolled in a sex offender treatment program but was rejected. This was because he would not admit, he was a sex offender. Although he may have been in denial, officials viewed Sal as a model prisoner for 15 years, in four Ohio prisons. Although he had four minor infractions on his record, he had no major rule violations. There were courses that he took called Living Without Violence, and Drug Awareness Prevention. He used his marine training to work as an electrician. While in prison, Saul won two small victories. One of them was a high school education. Second, it was his decision to quit drinking and any other intoxicants he might have been using. The truth is that in retrospect, Sowell's education and reformation efforts in prison didn't prepare him to deal with his problems on the outside. Despite his good behavior, parole officials have repeatedly denied Sowell's request for release, due to the violence of his crime. Despite that, he served his complete sentence. On June 20, 2005, he walked out of prison a free man, aged 45. Upon coming out of prison in 2005, Saul might have gotten it into his head, to try and help women, who had traded their bodies for cocaine with men. Saul offered them companionship and a safe place away from the dangers of the streets in Cleveland's east side. Despite that, if he felt betrayed by those he thought he was trying to help, he would terrorize, attack or ape them. Two women made the report who said that Saul befriended, and then turned on them. It has been reported that one motive police have pursued in interrogating, 
and investigating Saul is the helper theory. It appears when he was released from prison, he was clean and sober. It was considered unlikely to commit another rape based on his psychological evaluation. In the beginning, he had to register as a sex offender, reporting to the Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Office once a year until, he had to check in every 90 days starting in 2009. In fact, according to two women who were affiliated with him at the time, he started dating women who lived or hung out in the poor, and crime-ridden Mount Pleasant neighborhood, that he now called home. Tanya Doss, 43, is one of the women who claim to have been involved with Saul, and even attacked by him. She first met him in 2005, when she lived right across the street. He was not using crack cocaine at that time. Around this time, Saul began dating Laurie Fraser, a television reporter in Cleveland. It's no secret that Fraser made headlines following Saul's arrest in the Imperial Avenue Strangler case since Cleveland Mayor Frank Jackson is her uncle. She declined to speak for this story. Both the mayor and Fraser, who described herself as a former crack user, said Saul and Fraser, had an intimate relationship. The affair lasted from 2005 until 2007 or even earlier. But in the year 2007, Saul's personal and professional lives began to unravel. Some women near Imperial Avenue, began to go missing. In fact, it was a lousy year for Anthony Saul. Around this time, the stench of death began to permeate Imperial Avenue. After Saul failed to show up at work twice in a row, in July 2007, Custom Rubber Products Corporation terminated his employment. Saul's means of self-support were reduced to collecting and selling scrap metal, to provide him with a living. Police said that around the same time, in June 2007, a woman who was the first Imperial Avenue strangler victim, Crystal Dozier, went missing. During early June of that year, a neighbor of Imperial Avenue called police to complain about the smell of decaying flesh. It got worse and worse, as the stink got stronger. As the number of missing women grew, at an ever-increasing rate, more women went missing. It was known among the neighborhood women looking to kick it, smoke crack, and drink that Saul had a place, that was beyond the reach of his stepmother, the landlady who had disabilities, that prevented her from climbing the two flights of stairs to the third floor. Saul was cool, or at least he was supposed to be. Alan Saul, his half-brother, said that he started smoking crack cocaine not long after being released from prison in 2005. By 2007, the appearance of Saul had taken on the worn look characteristic of a chronic crack user. In 2009, Doss recalled, she began smoking crack with Saul and drinking, a dangerous combination linked to aggression in studies. Two women went to Souls in 2009 voluntarily to have a good time, they have said, but the jolly time suddenly turned violent. In both cases, the survivors recounted remarkably similar tales. They offer a peek at what might have happened to the women whose bodies were found at Souls' house, providing clues as to what might have happened to Doss and one of the other women. It has been alleged that Saul used alcohol and drugs to lure vulnerable acquaintances, drug users with criminal pasts who lived on the fringe, promising a better life. The encounters started out unthreateningly but quickly took a violent turn, when the beer and drugs ran out, or a question Saul didn't like, was asked. Doss, in her case, when Saul ran out of crack, he slapped her, choked her, and forced her to strip naked. Eventually, Saul left her alone on the bed after curling up on it. Apparently, in both cases, the women said that he became unusually calm after the attacks, offered them money, food, and watched as they walked out of the house. In many ways, these characteristics match those of the profile of sexually sadistic serial killers. 
A second pattern in the Imperial Avenue case also fits the profile of a typical serial killer, an appetite for violence that increases over time. In the entire year of 2007, only one woman, whose body was later found at Sowell's home, had gone missing. Then there was a gap of almost a year. In 2008, four women connected to him disappeared, and another woman claimed that he had attacked her. His home was eventually found to contain the bodies of four women who had disappeared. On December 8, 2008, the fifth woman was bleeding when she approached the police, and told them Saul had punched her in the head, and forced her to remove her clothes. In the following year, at least six of the women whose bodies were found at Sowell's house went missing. The rage was clearly directed at women, especially women who sold their bodies for drugs and were willing to risk their lives to get it. According to two women who had encounters with Saul in 2009, he remained obsessed with Fraser. However, despite repeated requests, Fraser declined to comment on this story. On October 2009, police had gone to Sowell's house to arrest him for the Sep 22nd case, the world of Saul came crashing down. When the police arrived, they were met with a nightmare scenario. The bodies were decomposing. After the body count had risen to six, police found and arrested Saul on October 31st, as the city reacted in horror and disbelief. The rest of the world watched in fascination. Cleveland police and prosecutors have released very little information about Saul. At the same time, the city waits for his trial on murder and rape charges stemming from Cleveland's grisliest crime spree, since the torso murders of the 1930s. However, there are still many questions. Is it possible that police and prosecutors failed to pursue charges against Saul, after a bloodied woman claimed he had attacked her, at his Imperial Avenue home in 2008? The case against Saul was dropped by authorities after a grand jury declined to indict her. After police let Saul leave, six more women whose bodies were found at Saul's Imperial Avenue home, went missing. Several conclusions can be drawn from this. While ultimately responsible for his own actions, Saul was shaped within a subculture, poorly served, by the social safety net. This is a world of casual brutality and degradation, where sexual favors, and drugs are now the currency of choice. It is a world in which many of us are safe behind our car's closed doors. And the relative comfort of our homes, choose not to think about, even though it exists within close proximity to our own. If we look closely, we can see glimpses of it, as they were seen through the lens of the life of the man, who was born Anthony Edward Sowell. Thank you for watching. Be careful out there.